Hi, this is a pleasure to present our work, A Side Journey to Titan. This is a joint work with Victor Lomne and Camille Mutchler from Ninja Lab and Laurent Humbert from the University of Montpellier. This is a side channel analysis of the Google Titan security key, which is a FIDO hardware token. It comes in three versions and all three are vulnerable to the attack. The FIDO protocol is a standard for two-factor authentication and it works in two steps. First, a registration phase where an ECDSA key pair is generated on the device and the secret key is stored there. For later authentication, when uh, it actually computes ECDSA signatures with the secret key. Site channel attack scenario on the Google Titan security key is for the adversary to steal the device to have a physical access to it um, and, uh, and record tight channel measurement of uh, ECDSA signatures for a given remote account. And then it give it back to the user um, without him noticing. <clears throat> Later on, it can extract the EC ECDSA key um, from the data and then create a virtual clone of it um, uh, and, and then use it as a second, order, a second factor authentication <clears throat> for the remote account. To avoid this kind of attack, um, the product is based on trusted hardware. It is a secure element hardware chip that is designed to resist physical attacks. When opening the Google Titan security key, we can see that it's actually manufactured by Fatian, and the secure element is an NXP A7000. There are other FIDO products that are based on the same secure element, the UBK, UBK Neo, first generation, and several security keys of Patreon. They are all vulnerable to the attack. There are also other NXP products that are vulnerable to the attack, the Java Card, Smart Card, the Jacobs, based on the NXP P5 chips. One of them, the NXP G3D081, was used, was used in this work. We call the product RIA as a second largest moon of Saturn. It helps us, since it's a Java card open platform, to uh, reverse engineer the ECDS implementation. The two products are open to have a clean access to the die, so we can put an electromagnetic probe over it very close to the die. This is a side channel uh, trace of the whole ECDSA execution. <clears throat> uh, inside it, the scalar multiplication is the most important computation, and we will focus on this computation here. Um, the NXP implementation is a constant time algorithm. It is a double and always. It has exactly 128 iteration for 256 bit nodes. So two bits of the nodes are used, are processed at each iteration. The scalar multiplication algorithm is in fact a left to right comb method of width 2, and scalars are not blinded. So, how works the left to right comb method of width 2? Um, it needs pre computed points, so four of them, P0 to P3, on the, on the elliptic curve, and the, the scalar is divided in two parts, the upper half and the lower half. And uh, from these inputs, the double and add always algorithm will process two bits by two bits. And for each iteration, it will execute a double operation on the elliptic curve and then an addition to a pre-computed point. The pre-computed point is chosen based on the value of the current two bits of the nodes of the scalar. So we need to find a data dependency between the traces and, and the, the nodes values. Um, so here is a, a trace of one iteration. So you have the double operation and then the addition. And uh, we found um, a correlation between the amplitude of the traces and the, the two bit values that are uh, processed during this iteration. To illustrate this leakage, I superpose here 1000 iteration a very specific time sample. Um, and uh, I colored in red the one corresponding to a leading lead zero and, and the other in blue. And we can see inside this gray rectangle that look and, looking at the traces actually gives us some information on the value of this leading bit. We use this observation to 
transform the traces in order to gather the information and remove most of the noise. From these transformed traces, we design a, a clustering algorithm that could classify some of the trace corresponding to a leading bit equal to zero uh, and, and, and put the other in, in another set. When it does classify one trace as leading bit equal to zero, then it's correct at 99%. So we end up with a list of nonces where inside the upper half of them is scattered a number of zeros value that we, um, that we identify. Um, some of them are wrong, but most of them are correct. Based on this information, we use an extended hidden number problem solver to extract the secret key. I won't go into the details here, everything is in the paper. I wanted just to stress out that for the attack to work, um, we, we cannot use all the information we have. We had to select the nonces that have five or more consecutive zeros. Um, so from 4,000 uh, nonces we had on UER, we ended up with 180 after this pruning phase. Doing so, um, we still had five erroneous um, nonces inside this 180 uh, available, and um, but we knew that LLL could um, could um, could make the attack work with only 80 signatures. So we would for the attack on random subset subset of 80 signatures inside the 180 we had, and uh, well, we finally recovered this, the secret key. We applied this process, the whole process to Titan, and um, uh, it was a little bit more challenging. We needed 6,000 signature to do to for the attack to work. Uh, they had there was it was more noisy, uh, but it still worked with the same process. Um, the acquisition phase, which is the online phase in the attack, um, took six hours, and uh, the offline phase took also about six hours. So I wanted to take some time to talk about uh, an important observation we did during this work. So we did a lot of simulation. One of them was to simulate the extended hidden number problem solver in our, in our setup. And um, <clears throat> so we, we, we are randomly uh, chosen choose five consecutive bits known inside, um, in, inside simulation of nonces. And, um, and we put these five consecutive bits anywhere inside the nonces. And we observed that the success rate was actually lower than what we observed on Titan. And in fact, the fact that the, the five consecutive known bits are located in the upper half of the nonce helped the attack. And this is quite unexpected. So we did a, a further experiment where we computed the attack success rate using 60 signatures, where the known block of five consecutive bits is located as, at a constant position i. And we did this experiment for all possible positions. The result is plot, plotted here, and we can easily see that when the known bits are in the lower half of the nonces, then the success rate is low. And when it comes to the upper half, then it gets high. <clears throat> we observe that it actually follows the binary form of the curve order. In FIDO, the elliptic curve, is, is, which is used, um, is, um, has a structured order, meaning that the lower half look random and the upper half is made of large sequences of one and zeros. And so the success rate changes actually flow, follow exactly uh, sequence or one of one and zeros. When the bit position of the non block matches a position where there is five consecutive ones or five consecutive zeros in the curve order, then the success rate is high. So somehow there is a relation between the non block position and the curve order that impacts the inner structure of the lattice that is radius in the attack. And uh, this observation shows that somehow better understanding this, um, this lattice structure could help better create the lattice from the first place and, and, and then improve the attack. Um, 
Another obvious observation is that elliptic curves with structured order, which are the most popular in practice, that contains large sequences of ones and zeros, are then easier to attack. Well, thanks for listening. listening. That's all for me.